Thoth Hermes podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. Hello friends and listeners, welcome to season 8, episode number 13 of the Thos Hermes podcast. My name is Rudolf and I am speaking to you from the outskirts of Vienna, Austria's lovely capital. Today is Sunday, May 22 and it's a great pleasure to have many of you who are returning customers coming back to this podcast that's great and i welcome everyone who is here for the first time it's wonderful that you have found us and i hope you will come back often and listen to our weekly episodes so today my guest will be somebody who has already been here on the podcast and uh, even especially especially lately i can see that his download figures for his first appearance have increased heavily again they always were very high because he's a great fellow mark stavish the director of the institute for hermetic sciences is here with us today and well i will tell you what we're going to talk going to talk about in a minute uh, once i have done this intro i will keep my talks today a little bit shorter because um, the interview itself is already 76 77 minutes i believe and also the musical pieces that i chose are not the shorter ones so i don't want to make this too long just to let you know that um well go to the website if you are new to this show and also if you are returning customers you'll find all the show notes there also in mark's interview we speak about two or three books that i will link uh, in in the in the show notes because they are um, maybe not very well known to you and for those of you who don't speak italian because he speaks about italian authors their name might be a bit difficult to catch so i will put those links in the show notes and uh, well while you're there why not leave me uh, feedback feedback on the episode page about this episode or a general feedback or ideas or criticism or thoughts you'll find possibilities on the website uh, i am sure there are three options how to get in touch with me there and there is always twitter and facebook of course and yes while you're there why not become a patron thanks to those of you who already are patrons thanks to those three of you who have joined since last week that's great and um, would be great to have more of you supporting the show because it's having more and more listeners which is wonderful and i think it would be nice if the proportion of those who support the show would also increase a bit we need that we need that to be sustainable in the long term it's just necessary right so um i would also like not to forget to point you towards kai Kobad radio the new radio internet radio station that i have launched exactly a month ago now um, at the occasion of our fifth anniversary here and uh, you can find that radio on radio.kaikobat.com kaikobat's being spelled k e i k o b a d and well if you didn't have a pen and 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 paper to write that down now pen and paper you see them old fashioned if you didn't have your smartphone ready by her now um then you can find also a link and also an audio player of that show on the Thoth Hermes homepage, on the first page, right there it is. So go there and listen to those uh, 24 seven uh, broadcasting of episodes from different podcasters, from all kinds of esoteric content from the web. And uh, well, you just tune in and you listen all the time to interesting shows, two eight hour loops a week that change uh, on Monday and on Friday. So it's, it's really 16 hours every week of new programs for you. That should be a great resource, shouldn't it? Okay. Well, I promise not to talk too much. That's it. So let's go into some music. And the uh, first piece, well, I, I chose three 
I wouldn't call that ambient music. It's it's much more than that. But three from three artists, uh, which I found on the internet, and uh, I just thought it would be nice for this show to bring them on. Um, the first uh, artist is called Chiasmos, and uh, the musical piece that we play from Chiasmos is called Blurred. Blurred, yes, and um, Chiasmos, well, I might just read you a little text that he has, tiny little text. In the vast ocean of Nirvana, every microsecond a universe pops up as so one fades away. It's omnifying how this creation and destruction plays in such a harmony. How true and how also fitting to a hermetic talk that we are going to have, Mark, Stavish and I. So listen now to Blurred by Chiasmos.
Blurred by Chiasmos, uh, wonderful ambient music, I believe, and uh, good entry into our thoughts here today with Mark Stevich, who I'm really happy to have back on this show. Mark is doing such an extraordinary job with his Institute of Hermetic Sciences in Pennsylvania, and you also find a lot of highly interesting content on the website that they have, and you can book teachings and lessons there. Uh, well, uh, go there, Institute of Hermetic Sciences. I'll put again the link on the show notes of this uh, episode and uh, you should really have a look and also book some courses if you are a seriously interested um, occultist or esotericist or spiritual searcher or whatever. Well, that brings me already right into the beginning of our interview because in our talk, we decided to do this talk in order to help a few people on one hand guide to be a guide to to bring them uh into the i can't say right ideas because that would be not the right way to say that but to help them find their way in the esoteric world which is of course always changing always different wherever you are and also it's with the internet which is a great resource but it has also become more complicated more difficult to find your right way and um, so this is very good for the newcomer but it's also i believe highly interesting for those experienced esotericists and occultists because um you will have opinions which might be diverse from those of mark and myself and um maybe you agree with him and you might have your comments also to make so please do please go on the website or on twitter or on facebook once again um, and leave us your comments there or on YouTube, of course. I will forget to say that. Um, it will be interesting to hear you about that. And um, I think it's a fascinating talk we had. Uh, you are going to enjoy that, I'm sure, already. And that's why I said about the name, the beginning we talk, how would you call that? Is it esotericism? Is it spirituality? Is it occultism? Whatever. Um, that's how we start the interview and uh, we get deep into those things. And as I said, without further ado, I won't be long um, this time for this intro. Without further ado, let's go and meet Mark, Mark Stevich, who welcomes me and us in his office in Pennsylvania. And that's where we go now. So enjoy the talk. And I'll come back after about 36 minutes with more music, as usual. Enjoy! Here comes the interview. It's a great pleasure to have someone here back uh, on the Thought Hermit podcast to whom we spoke already, well, I think it's almost a year ago now. And uh, uh, it was a great talk we had back then. Mark Stavish, it's great to have you back here on the show. Thank you for your time. Oh, it's great to be back. It's always wonderful to, to be with you and, and your audience. It's just such a wonderful bunch of folks. Thank you. That, that's great. And they love you. <laughs> so that's mutual. Um, Mark, uh, when we discussed this over Facebook, our talk here today, we were kind of um, thinking um, of doing like a, a, a kind of guidance to people who are interested in this world. Uh, well, I hesitate with the name and maybe we should start by finding out what name we want to give to this world. Um, the, the, the world of magic, of hermeticism, of, of, of for others, for witchcraft or whatever it is. And to, to enter that world in what way is the best way to find out what is for you. There is so much out there that can be found, but there's a lot of things out there that you wouldn't want to find um so with your experience that we talk about about the path that one can take um, which is of course never unique and will always be very individual i guess but there are certain there are certain things that everyone should observe and and start with Maybe we should start with finding for ourselves the name for that world that I just named like that, because uh, um, what is it actually? Is it magic? Is it what is it in your point of view? Well, I, I think we need to use a broader term and mm. 
the term I like to use is esotericism because that d- yeah. distinctly refers to an interior path. However, mm. because that may have a variety of meanings to people and can often be confusing, we can use a gentler term and a broader one of spirituality. But of yeah. course, then we have to define what do we mean by spirituality? What is this spirit? What is this thing? So for me, the easiest term to use is esotericism. And I will use that interchangeably with the term right. spirituality for folks. That being said, there are different aspects of that or functions. Uh, we tend to think of Western esotericism as hermeticism. It's not exclusively. We know that. However, Generally speaking, we can refer to the hermetic path because the influence of Egyptian beliefs, uh, Greco-Egyptian beliefs, uh, and what we could think of as new Egypt, Egyptified beliefs, <laughs> if we yeah, want to Egyptified call it that, right, nice, yeah. <laughs> uh, is seen throughout uh, Western magical practices from the earliest period, from the classical period on. And even right there, when I say magical practices, I don't mean exclusively what we think of as ritual magic, but we would include astrology and alchemy as well. And then from that, we get into different areas of divination. But you see, those are kind of subcategories and may not necessarily be of interest to everyone. So I'm going to be approaching this as the director of the Institute for Hermetic Studies, I'll be approaching this from that hermetic yes, view. Yes, you are, of course. And, yeah. and those of you listening will realize that everything I say has value to you, and you can then extract that out and apply that as you wish. If you want, Mark, it would be certainly interesting also to touch uh, briefly later on in this talk on those uh, separate paths like uh, astrology, alchemy, divination, even divination, because it is out there and it's uh, certainly to get the experienced person briefly talk about that will be interesting to our listeners, I'm sure. And I agree, esotericism is certainly the, the basic term. I always hesitate with it. I tell you why, because of course, esoteric has been so much, I will even say abused as a term, right? It, it, it's, it's, it's become, well, very, um, I hope I, I don't, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not offending anyone, but new agey, you know, it's, it's so, it's so, it's so superficial and unilateral, exactly the contrary of what hermeticism is, where you have to see both sides all the time. And uh, if you omit the dark side and oh, we are all happy and we're all good and we all love each other, that will not, in my opinion, lead you anywhere. That's why I'm hesitating. Occultism is, of course, another term. What about that term occultism? You didn't you didn't bring that in at all. Is that is there a reason to that? I think just because it's filled with so many problems and, and we need to recognize that it can be used in different ways and it simply refers to anything which is not seen, anything which is hidden. Um, and then we have terms like the black arts and that has a mm. uh, often a a misinterpretation as being uh, something uh, we'll say satanic or demonic or destructive as opposed to simply black and not seen hidden just like when we refer to the black earth of Egypt you know it, we're not we're referring right. to a that which is there but not visible to us so uh, I, I prefer not to use the word occultism and for a lot of uh, reasons. And I think even for occultists, I don't, I, th- it means that often occultists get very hung up on the nature of the occult practice. That is the technique. Uh, they become mm-hmm. technique junkies. Uh, they often want to jump straight into technique or practice without having a philosophical foundation or background. And that's where esotericism comes in because regardless of what you do, you need to have an understanding of why you're doing it. What is the end goal? And I've always said within Hermeticism, within spiritual practices and traditions I'm familiar with, the end goal is uh, the survival and continuity of consciousness, the creation of a sense of self that can survive the pressures of the non-beingness from which we come. That ain't soft, that not, that void, whatever you want to call it. So uh, that said, we know what we're doing and why we're doing it. 
if you want to simply undertake a, a series of occult practices and just kind of see where it leads you, well, that's fine. But then don't be surprised when you get eaten by tigers in the jungle. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, I think that may be the uh, the first part of advice that we should elaborate on here is um, if someone has found out about esotericism and thinks, hmm, just something I would like to, to go further and dig in a bit, um, to what is the aim to that? What can be the aim to that? As you just said, if you just go on and uh, and run for it, then you'll f you'll find your problems. Um, what what in you mentioned briefly three things? Maybe we can elaborate a bit on that. What are for the searcher? Let's call him or her like that for the moment. Uh, what should the searcher be? aiming for in the first place. Yeah, and they have to understand that. They have to know why they're doing what they're doing. And as I've often said, if we're honest with ourselves and we say, okay, I am undertaking this journey because I'm unhappy with my life and I want to change something about my life, that's great. And it's far better to do that and be honest with yourself than say, oh, I want to be enlightened or I want to find peace or some nonsense like that because you don't even know what those are. We can't, yeah. we, we can't, how would you know it when you get it? But if you know you're unhappy about your life, you could begin to self-examine and self-reflect. And that's where we get to the ancient uh, initiations, as, as it was said over the temple of Apollo at Delphi, know thyself. Right. So if you start with that premise of I'm going to know myself, not necessarily like what I find, but at least know myself and move from there, then you're going to be in a good place. And it doesn't mean your self-knowledge has to be something that other people approve of or agree with, because it's your knowledge of yourself and what you do with it on your journey. And that self-knowledge is going to decide what journey you take. You're going to say, you know what? Uh, I'm here living in the United States. I'm here living here in Western Europe. It's the 21st century. It's 2022. Uh, I like this idea of a, a, a path involving faith and devotion, but I just can't stir it up in myself. I just can't get it. What can I do? What other path is better for me? What path will help me experience that devotion? Should I want to or need to anchor that in? Okay, well, as you know, almost all of the old schools, and we see that in all the, the, the medieval and Renaissance practice, uh, Agrippa says it, uh, uh, Paracelsus says it, uh, we say it with... Um, Oh, uh, the various Arabic sources as well. Uh, you must have faith. You cannot mm -hmm. doubt. Well, how do I get faith in this stuff? I, I'm not in the Middle Ages. I'm not in the Renaissance. I don't have this magical worldview that might exist still in parts of the world like Haiti or Morocco or, or these things or, or, or Thailand. How do I get this? Well, then you're honest with yourself. You say, I'm going to undertake the path they tell you you shouldn't take, and that is the one of psychic experiences. I'm going to delve into some kind of experiencing psychic phenomena for a period of time. Okay, now you know what you're doing and you know why you're doing it, which means you don't get lost in there. See, some people just wander into the psychic phenomena thing and they never get out. It never takes them anywhere. They get lost in there. But you're saying, I know why. I, I need this experience to help me move forward because I, I believe in theory that these things exist, but I don't have the emotional connection to it. And that's the emotional connection that makes all of it function, that makes all of it work. I think you're saying something really essential there um, to know why you're doing it, because um, it's like when somebody goes on Google to look for a term and then they type it in and then they see another term and, oh, let me look into that. And you can wonder, all of us know that, three hours around, even intelligently on, on yes. Google and in the end, you do, what have I done with these three hours? I've gotten nowhere <laughs> in a way. And I think that describes also what you just said, doesn't it? You have to have to do what you do with conviction that you need to do it, right? Exactly. And, and that's the same with any of your ritual work. So that when you get involved in other things like ritual work or alchemical work, it is partially an experiment. We are seeing what will happen, but we have an idea. We have a clear reason why we're there. We're not just uh, doing some kind of abstract art where we're, you know, throwing paint on the wall and then seeing what pattern arises. 
We're not just, you know, doodling around and seeing what arises from our unconscious, like automatic writing. We have a clear beginning, middle and an end. We have a, a fairly good idea as to what the outcome might be or could be or should be. Okay. And we give a, with that, we give a rhythm to our work. Exactly. Right? We develop a rhythm and that, that inner rhythm, that inner frequency or repetition is what allows us to reprogram our psychic structures. And when I say psychic structures, yes, I'm referring to what we think of as psychic anatomy, but primarily that's just an extension of our sense of self that we call the subconscious. Mm -hmm. Right. We're that, that which we are when we are asleep, when we're no longer taking in data from the, the sensory data from the physical world or deep in meditation, and we're not taking anything, that which is us or our sense of us, we call that the subconscious. And from that, that sense of I-ness, we begin to shape that and remold that, expand that, develop it, make it more flexible, more dynamic and uh, more in tune with what we call archetypes or ideal images or ideals. Yeah, so ideals like the platonic ideals, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or any of the ideals that you might see on the tree of life or tarot cards or yeah. Egyptian uh, or Greco Roman pantheons. We use these ideals to help us progress. It's like a hero. You know, uh, I was watching a, a video the other day and it, it was taking me back to my younger years in which all of these martial art greats were sitting around talking. And as they said, uh, you know, what was really nice back then is you you had a hero. You knew who this person was and and they were an ideal. And that's the role of the teacher. You know, the teacher is that ideal. They're a hero. You look up to them and and you, they help you. And they're an example of what you are working on and what you can become. Yeah. And it's the same way in art. It's the same way in science. It's the same way in business. So what we begin to realize is that whatever we focus our mind upon, we develop a relationship with, and that reshapes us. So now we're learning the first rule of why we have to watch our mind why we have to pay attention to the contents of our own mind. That really, no matter what we're working with, whether it's alchemical uh, tinctures or uh, metallic alchemy, whether it's ritual work, whether it's anything, ultimately all of it is in and through us and our own mind is the mediator. So for everyone who begins this journey should spend at least one to three years doing nothing but mental training so mm -hmm. that they can learn to reflect and understand their own mind. And that just opens up tremendous doors. And that's the hard part because that's the boring part. It's not exciting. Yeah, exactly. It's not uh, taking a wand and doing marvelous things like some exp some believe. And um, are you going as far as Israel regarded by saying somebody who takes seriously up on call it magical work, as he says in that case, should do a psychoanalysis before? Are you going that far? I would if it's possible, but I know it's not possible for everyone. And I also know that um, everyone who engages in the, the psychotherapeutic process may not necessarily have a therapist who is s supportive or even understanding of their work, or in some cases, right. may be supportive and understanding, and I've had to deal with these but are completely incompetent. Yeah. So I've had deal with folks who went to analysts and the therapist was very supportive and eager to help them and encourage them to do things, which, you know, really made things much worse. Okay. Okay. Are you making a difference between subconscious and unconscious? No, I'm is not. this the same? Uh, the yeah, same I'm right? just using right. it interchangeably. It, yeah, it's, it's Freud versus Jung in a way, yes. right? The two terms. Yeah, 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 yeah. But sorry, I interrupted you uh, when we wanted to add something about. No, uh, no, that, that's also if you can if you have a good therapist, that's fine. And you know, historically, the role of the teacher was your therapist. Yeah. Um, that's a hard role these days. Hmm. There are many Probably. analysts who would like to pretend to be gurus and initiators, and there's a lot of initiators and gurus who, who might pretend to be therapists, but uh, it's, it's a hard role.
So you, some, what you have to then begin to realize is that in your search for instruction and guidance, you're probably not going to find a single person who is the perfect embodiment of all your uh, projections, ideals, and needs, which is okay. Yeah, yeah. But it doesn't mean you, you ignore them because they say something you don't like. You know, yeah, exactly. It, it just exactly. means that yeah. you realize yeah. that this person is exceptionally good technically, and I can learn a tremendous amount from them. Hmm. This person is much better in helping me you know, face my own self-deception and overcome it. So I, I need to spend time. Uh, that. Uh, that reminds me of uh, oh, just very recently I did an interview with Rod Clark on Barden yeah. and the work with Barden, and uh, of course many people drop out of the Barden work because they find it so hard. And I I mentioned that to Ron, and he uh, said, "Well, maybe," uh, and that's why I gave the subtitle to that episode, calling it, instead of "Know Thyself," "Work Thyself." So he said, "Just don't over." over uh, do your your f first pass um, aims just try to do what you can and go on and move on do you think there is a problem also that maybe this aim is at the beginning sometimes in general not with Barton I mean now but in general put up too high on a uh, on the level and you can never reach it and therefore you kind of give up oh, or definitely. You lose yourself perfectionism is is a uh, is a curse of the rock as someone once said yeah, yeah and that perfectionism is is a problem in Barton it's a problem because the language of Barton says don't move on until you've mastered this step well yeah i don't even yeah. know what mastering that step is yeah. yeah so the language itself is very uh prohibitive whereas the individual must simply do their best yeah and then yeah. relax take a little bit of a break maybe a few days maybe a week then go back and notice what's the difference Or, Definitely. you know, not, not burn out. I say, okay, I'm going to do this practice for three weeks. I'm going to do this for six weeks, seven weeks, maybe tops. And then, then you stop. You because, set yourself that goal, so to speak, right? Right. And then mm -hmm. because doing that, doing a practice like that every day. So I'm going to sit here every day at 7 a.m. And I'm going to practice for 20 minutes or 15 minutes. And I'm going to do that for seven weeks is far better for you than thinking I'm going to sit here every day for an hour or I'm just going to do this until I master it because you don't know it's open-ended but when you have clear mm -hmm. achievable goals things happen in a way that you're uh, not going to be prepared for that can't be described for you because at that end of that four week period that six week period whatever you've chosen you know you definitely did it And you can reflect yeah. back and say, okay, I did that for 15 minutes and I did it no matter what. And uh, that's it. And since willpower is so important and what is will, but simply being to put up with pain and boredom, that's really what it is. The ability to put up with pain and boredom and push through and stay focused. That willpower, which you develop in that period of time is transferable to everything else you do in life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. And we also begin to recognize the quality of our own mind, the quality of the thoughts we bring to ourselves day to day. You know, I'm trying to focus on, well, you know, why focus on Earth? What's the big deal? Why these yellow squares, or these green squares, or these stuff? Well, it's because what you're doing is you're awakening within your own mind the stability of your own mind. Mm-hmm. It's not to meditate on earth. Who cares about that? Who cares about meditating on a rock? What it's yeah, doing yeah, is it's yeah. awakening within your own mind, the facility of stabilization upon which everything else is built. Yeah, and then the yeah. same thing with water. Water brings reflection. Air brings some fluidity and, and the mobility and connectedness and fire brings that. So we begin to work through those things. So Barden is a, I was going to tell, you know, say to your listeners, Barden is a great place to start. There are some minor problems with it, uh, but I think that anyone who everyone should have initiation to hermetics, everyone should have that a copy of it. And mm -hmm. everyone should have a copy of uh, the Sutras of Pantanjali, probably two or three different translations so they can get different commentaries, because in there, what you realize is that you're being told, learn how to sit, 
learn how to relax, learn how to breathe and learn how to focus your mind. And whatever you focus your mind on, you enhance those qualities within yourself. I mean, that's the summary of that practice. And with that said as well, everyone should have a copy of um, either What We May Be by Pierre Ferrucci or the works of Azanjoli on psychosynthesis and active will. Because within mm-hmm. that same framework, you have mental training. You have mental training that is directly applicable to your, your path, no matter what it is. And what you begin to see now is as if you're walking around a, a circular table. You know, if we have a statue in the center of that table or a, a cake or a dessert or a fine tray of something, we're walking around and we're seeing it from all these different angles, but we're still focusing on the same thing. So all of those books together, uh, the works of psychosynthesis, as in Jolie and uh, Pierre Ferrucci, um, the works of uh, Franz Barden, you know, that is uh, particularly initiation mm-hmm. hermetics and some of the just basic texts on yoga sutras and some of the new thought books. Uh, I can't think of any particular mm-hmm. volume at the moment, but the, the writers on new thought uh, are too readily and easily dismissed by uh, folks right. today. And, and they really have no idea what they're talking about. In fact, I right. would tell if I could say it with certainty, I would tell your listeners mm-hmm. spend five years in Amwork. Mm-hmm. And, but I don't know what the lessons are like anymore. So I can't, I can't say that with any certainty, but if it were back in the day of the seventies, eighties, I'd say just do five years and you'll have all the mental training practices you need and, and you will then excel at everything else you do. I was just laughing because now within 35 seconds, you, you put in three things that I had on my list. Uh, no, two of them I had on the list, to be honest. Uh, and uh, and uh, one was Yoga Sutra, the other one was New Thought. I was going to ask you because, of course, uh, you are the director of the Institute for, for Hermetic Studies. Hermeticism today is often seen through the Kibalion, that famous book, which sums up basically Hermeticism in those seven in those seven terms and uh, of course others say well but that's 19th century and new thought is something that's really we shouldn't touch on that's not original and so on and well there you are and mentioned new thought that i was going to ask you uh, maybe you can develop it a bit further on that new thought thing and then i come to amork uh, which was the third thing that you just mentioned but um, um the new thought thing i also think it's it's a very good starter for people but uh, I was you know it better because you're much closer to that I was completely unaware of this until last year when our uh, one of our board members uh, Dr. Uh, John White who's a PhD in philosophy and a certified union analyst did a six week course for us on New Thought and I was completely unaware of the fact that New Thought was rooted in uh German romanticism. Oh, really? And he is his presentation on it was like, I just wow. And he said, now, this is important because when we go from German romanticism, we then take it back to what to natural philosophy, and to natural magic, boom. So if you're telling me that new thought is not rooted in hermeticism, or is not an extension of the hermeticism, you don't know its history. Now, we do know that there were some New Thought authors that were deeply influenced by Indian philosophy, and that's okay. Because in my mind, if we look at the early classical period, we know that there was a tremendous amount of exchange of ideas along the Silk Road, and that there was a uh, there were what they called gymnosophist and Brahmanist communities in Alexandria. Mm-hmm. Uh, there mm-hmm. was a Arabic and later Latin translation of uh, the sutras of Pantanjali, although there's some question as to what that edition was. So this idea that we can narrow this down and isolate it into these very narrow uh, containers is, is a tragic error, particularly when we're Absolutely. dealing with things that are saying that they're not culturally limited. I mean, the, the, that, the yoga that we're talking about here is about self-awareness. It has nothing to do with yeah. the external. So just saying that you can't practice that or you're practicing something not Western. Well, we have a whole host of self-reflections. Uh, the, um, the practices of um, 
uh, Ignatius Loyola or a whole series yeah. of reflections. And we see those in other ways. Uh, and those are very heavily culturally bound for better or worse. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah. both for better or worse. It has many strengths and also weaknesses. In fact, I'm going to be interviewing a fellow next month who uh, knew um, Malachi Martin. And uh, he said, you know, you, you always knew a Jesuit when they walked in the room. <laughs> <laughs> you just you always knew a Jesuit when they walked in the room. Mm -hmm. you know, just mm -hmm. boom, that. Yeah. That, Focused. And, yeah. And, yeah. There was just something, mm -hmm. that thing about them that was trained and developed over over years. So mental training is what they provided. Sure. And that mental training of the Jesuits is really no different than uh, a form of uh, tantric visualization. Mm. So I find it interesting that the further you get in, I believe in all schools, at least of those I know, you can say that um, the further you get up in the studies and also in rank or initiation or whatever you want to call it, the more you realize that what you just said, uh, the one that brings us all to one to one final thought in the end uh, um, becomes clearer. And so those discussions about this comes from India, this comes from here or for there, or this is a limitation and has no historic background and so on, become void because in the end, uh, when you approach the one to call it like that, <laughs> that all disappears, right? Yeah. And what is your experience? Remember, uh, ultimately, we're concerned with ex personal experience on the path. So yeah. if you want me to talk to you about historical issues in, in esotericism, we can do that. And I do that often. However, I, I make the point that I simply don't care. Right. right. Uh, my concern is uh, that we understand and recognize that as a reality. But that reality doesn't limit or define what I am capable of doing or achieving. And to make it work for us here is the, is the, is the point. Right. right. Yeah. Right. Right. You mentioned three, no, two terms just before. I'm not forgetting about Amar. I can come back to that. Uh, you mentioned two points just before, um, which are words that in the 21st century are often a bit hard to bite, especially for beginners in, 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 in the world of esotericism. That was faith and devotion. Yeah. And I might add a third term to that um, divine or divinity. Right. Um, so um, maybe can you, if do you want to uh, explain or define them a little bit in a way as esotericism sees them, because maybe we are just tainted very much by Christian backgrounds, which makes it difficult for some people or deviate from the essential or whatever. Can you, could you give some help there? I think the first one is faith, faith and devotion. Devotion is dedication to whatever you do. And that's the emotional connection. So if uh, you want to, you know, do exceptionally well in your academic studies or your period on the high school athletic team or your perseverance of, uh, of a, a woman or uh, of a uh, even a business goal, you have no trouble getting the emotional energy up to do that. That's devotion. You're devoted to it. That is your object of yeah. worship. That is your ideal goal, which you think about and absorbs your mind all the time. And as your mind is absorbed by it, the energies go to it. Okay, that's a yoga, whether you, whether you recognize it or not, or practice it as that, that's an esoteric practice. What happens yeah. is esotericism takes what we tend to do naturally, uh, separates it apart for us so we can begin to analyze and understand it, and then we put it back together again. And that, that needs to be really understood. People meditate very well on something they like. <laughs> You know, when they go to the movies, they don't have any trouble in met being meditated when they're listening to the, the news yeah. or even when they're scanning their Facebook posts. They don't have any trouble being absorbed. They're meditating. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the faith is that confidence. That's the more of the confidence. I really, truly have confidence in the efficacy of what I'm doing in the person that's teaching me this and the person that's telling me this in these practices and I have belief in myself and my own capacity to undertake this. And maybe not now immediately, but that through my own personal effort can achieve the same things others have done. Could one say faith is something very practical and personal and not something out there into the cloud, right? Well, that's it. It, it, it can't be because when we have faith 
it is an emotional connection. So it's always within us. Mm -hmm. Even if it is to this external idea of an external deity, it still is within us. Because Mm -hmm. there can be an external deity, but if you don't have any faith in it, it's just like anything else. There's a government, but if you don't have faith in it, or a doctor, you don't have faith in it, it, it's going to diminish or eliminate any potential benefits that you might have from that relationship. Definitely. So your confidence is what we're talking about. That's why when we when we talk about these practices, which we said earlier, it's good to say, okay, I really need something that's going to let me know there's some truth, there's some reality to this. And I do think it's okay for people to do some what we'll call psychic exploration. You know, not heavy handed, not not too much. You don't want to overwhelm yourself or open doors you can't close. But, you know, just psychic games with each other, telepathy games, trying to know who's going to answer, call you when they answer the phone or uh, trying to do uh, just basic things that we used to do all the time. Uh, I, I, they're fine. In fact, I remember in the 60s and 70s as a kid, uh, and they were, some of them were in existence, they're still in print into the 80s, there were these books on you know, psychic party games, okay. which, which is important because how we look at this is joyfulness and playfulness that we bring to it. People get too serious in their work. We see that with magicians all the time. They're such a dour bunch. But <laughs> when we look at the famous... Um, Serbian, Serbian inventor, uh, Nikola Tesla. Tesla, yeah, yeah. Uh, the story goes that his mother used to play various memory games and psychic games. With him. Well, that was mental training. Sure. If you want to be like a genius like him, you have to do what he did to get there, which was the mental training, which is the do same thing for psychic. Do you think that uh, nowadays North America – at least that's my feeling from here in Europe, has more uh, activity in the field of esotericism and hermeticism and so on than maybe Europe because um, the spiritual background in general is still stronger. Because when you mention Serbia at the time of Tesla, of course, they had a very strong orthodox background. So maybe the work with the spirit in whatever way, mental way, um, was maybe more normal than it is nowadays here in Europe. Do you think that... the the North American background helps to that? I think that it helps only to the degree that we have in the United States developed through the media over the last 20 years in particular, but the last 10 uh, specifically, an occulture or a culture, a pop culture around occultism that is almost unescapable. It's very strong. It's very evident. And, excuse me, I believe that that may help bring people into the the practice, but it can be very detrimental to them sustaining it because they have false ideas as to what to expect or what will happen. Uh, So, and and what's demanded of them. Uh, Many people have these media notions of of the student-teacher relationship you know, which just aren't real. They're not realistic yeah. and they're not real. Uh, you have to bring something to the relationship. It's not one way. So I think that the current culture is beneficial in a broad sense, but not in a narrow in particular. I think maybe the culture, and this is just a guess on my part from a few people I've spoken to, the culture in Europe is very beneficial to certain aspects of traditional esotericism that you and I are familiar with. Mm. However, even there, I think it's detrimental because of uh, a false elitism. Here in the United States, we have a false egalitarianism, and I think there you have a false elitism. Yeah. Would that does yeah. that sound uh, maybe good to you? <laughs> that sounds, yeah, that sounds good to me. That's a, that's a good point. And now it's time for our musical break. And this musical break brings us back to some great ambient music, um, which I think uh, is really a good fit for this uh, this, this interview, this show. Um, this time, the piece that we're going to hear right now is called 
time and space and it is by the cinematic orchestra that's how they call themselves and i might also read you that little intro text that is going with it one swing set well worn but structurally sound seeks new home make memories with your kid or kids so that someday he or she or they will look into the backyard and feel the ache of sentimentality and desperately as i did this afternoon it's all fragile and fleeting, dear reader, but with this swing set, your children will be introduced to the ups and downs of human life gently and safely, and may also learn the most important lesson of all, no matter how hard you kick, no matter how high you get, you can't go all the way around. Okay, that will be the intro text for time and space nice text i believe and then we go back to mark and have another 40 minutes to talk a great interview this time uh, we really took our time to go into things and when we are finished there is the third piece of music of course that is by a group called into space and it's called transmission 94 no not 93 94 i don't think it's something to do with salima but uh, I just thought it would be fun. Transmission 94 will be the text, uh, the name of the text that we, uh, that we hear there. And so, um, yeah, and after that, of course, after the third piece of music, after the interview, I will come back to you and tell you who is going to be on our show next week, the exciting news of episode 14. Right, so now, time and space, then back to Mark Stavish, and transmission 94 to round it all up before we go to the little outro talk and next week's program.
That brings us back to the core of our question here, because um, uh, so that person that uh, we imagine and who started to look uh, to, to know uh, themselves and uh, start to work and at Of course, at some point they will necessarily, it may be even a good thing, but maybe that often happens too early, try to find a school, so to speak. So now maybe we can go to something like Amorg that you just mentioned, but just as an example. Um, I myself, I must say, at a very early stage in the work I did, that was when I lived in France back at the time, mm -hmm. I yeah. came across Amorg by coincidence yeah. because I fell into the shop basically they had at the time in Paris. Yeah. And and it helped me the first three or four years yes. an awful lot. And uh, I know that you also, you had a, a kind of a similar experience and much more active than I myself, I believe. So um, that kind of schools like Amark, let's not only speak about that. Um, how do you find the right one for yourself? How will you find out if that's not just paying money to something who wants your money and nothing else? I got to tell you, that's, that's hard these days. I mean, mm -hmm. it really is. We have, we have several problems that we try to deal with. And one is, and, and you know, I can talk about why we did the Institute for Hermetic Studies the way we did is we set it up as classes that you can take either in order or a la carte as a cafeteria approach. It's up to you. And the reason we did that is because getting people to commit to a, a course of study was very difficult. Mm -hmm. Now we could get them to commit to a course of study if we dressed it up and we had initiations and we gave them titles and names, but that wasn't what it was about. We, we approached it as a school. It's mm -hmm. a school and, and you're going to learn stuff and you're going to learn how to have inner experiences and become self-reliant. Uh, so you know, I think everyone will benefit from our, our course on Folding the Rose, which we have online for free. We have a tremendous amount of material online at no cost to the subscriber. We pay for yeah. it to stay online. So uh, I think that's a good place for people to start is Unfolding the Rose. But, but that said, the mental training part, how do we get into that? Again, I, I used to have a tremendous amount of uh, support and, and belief in Amwork. Uh, I don't know if I can say that now, these days, for different reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that because it had a very unique mental training approach that we can only find in, say, something like Barden or something like New Thought or something like uh, the Yoga Sutras. You know, it's, it's a mental training that now is applicable to anything and everything else you do. The problem with too yeah. many schools is you get in there and immediately it's like, like a golden dawn approach where, okay, you have to memorize all these symbols. Now you have to memorize all these tarot cards. Now you learn how to do uh, astrological charts. Oh, and you have to do your geomancy too. Well, maybe not everyone is suited for that. Yeah. And, and then yeah. you're doing ritual work. But you don't even understand enough about yourself. So you're putting all this faith on the externalization of the ritual to do for you, which you have to be doing for yourself inwardly first to get that ritual to work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I think a good, and you mentioned this in one interview. I don't know if it was with me or it was with someone else, but you brought up the, um, oh, I know. It was the interview that you did with uh who is that fellow the wonderful fellow who did the translations of the three books of agrippa of occult philosophy uh, eric eric purdue eric yeah. purdue yes and agrippa his translations of agrippa are essential to to read that or or to yeah. get a, a cheaper edition and and make notations like i've done uh mm. you know he talked about in there uh, Agrippa is telling us why magic works, which comes back to the imagination and the power of the mind. So exactly. uh, you mentioned the uh, Ogdoatic path, I believe it was. Yes, indeed. And their first one or two or three volumes, I don't remember how it is. It used to be five volumes. The magic philosophy, it's called this five volumes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That's a good source to get a, the philosophical view of how and why this works. Definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, I mean, it's a fun thing you say that because that's, that's, I keep saying that, uh, and it's, it's wonderful books. It's so hard to get them, unfortunately, nowadays, but uh, it's, it's really, it's really great, a great background also. 
there's also the philosophy of nature that you mention a lot lately. I don't know if you've always done that or if it's at the moment uh, very much in you at the moment. But when I read your Facebook post, I can see that uh, reference often. Uh, what about the philosophy of nature and Jean Dubuis? What about them? He is a spectacular source of information. And of course, that's all online. You can pay for printed copies off Amazon if you care to, or you can get their information as French or English downloads. I think there's a German edition as well. Uh -huh. uh, and you can get that at portaluchus.france.fr. And uh, I don't know where the German one is, but I, I think there's one out mm -hmm. there. I've never come across a German one. I know the French and okay. English one, yeah. So that's available. And... There you will have a tremendous introduction to very effective and efficient interior initiation using a Golden Dawn style system without all of the uh, excesses. Uh, the, the understandings of the path working was, for me, some of the cleanest and finest and most practical approaches to path working I've ever seen. In addition, the basic course fundamentals of esotericism is... It is dense. It is. It, he was an engineer by training. He worked in nuclear engineering as well as electronics. So he, okay. he writes as an engineer. He's very clear. He's very to the point. And that is very important. Anyone will benefit from his book, Fundamentals or Contact with Eternity, which is a form of natural magic for initiation. Uh, mm -hmm. Very similar to the Renaissance natural magic, but it, it doesn't use any of that language. His courses on spagyrics or plant alchemy, as we call it, and mineral alchemy are invaluable. So once you have developed a certain amount of inner discipline and inner capacity, which is what we're always working, discipline develops capacity. Remember that. So as I have more, <laughs> say it again, say it again, this is the crucial discipline word. develops capacity. So as I develop Absolutely. my inner, di my discipline, I develop my inner capacity. As I develop my inner capacity, I develop my ability to achieve more. And this becomes a reinforcing cycle, which we call the path, you know, path of self-awareness, self-actualization. It's not just there enough that we're self-aware, but we actualize it. We bring that awareness into activity all sorts of activities in our lives. So his courses on, on, on alchemy are, are essential to that, to that journey. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, there's a term also that runs around a lot, a bit, a little bit like new thought lately. Uh, I'm, I'm personally a bit more reserved to that terminology, but what about your thoughts on mindfulness? There is that term mindfulness that flies around also a bit in the new age uh, um, world. That, and there's a problem with that. What happens is people don't understand things in their cultural context. And mindfulness simply means paying attention to what you're doing. Yeah. So when and mindfulness is really the beginning of the journey. <laughs> so, so it, yeah, where's the difference between mindfulness and devotion? Because devotion is an emotional connection to an ideal. Uh, mindfulness is paying attention to the fact that at this moment I'm emotionally connected to the ideal. Right. I'm not distracted. Right. I'm not off here. You know, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not in church or in my in my lodge, my magical lodge, and and uh, doing my visualization of the God form and and, and staring at the, the the breasts of the young woman next to me. You know, uh, unless of course that's part of the ritual, but usually it's not. Or or I'm I'm paying attention to the gurgling sound and the guy to the other side because his he he ate too much or didn't eat enough and his stomach's making noises, or yeah. or or the truck that goes by. No mindfulness is I am. Focused is in another way we could say it is concentration. I am focused mm -hmm. on what I'm doing and I'm right. not letting anything right. distract me. Right. And that's just a tool, basically, not the movement, so yeah. to speak. Right? That, that's just the yeah. beginning, it's yeah. not the end. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, of course, then something comes into the game which uh, creates a lot of. I'd call it even a distraction, even if it's well intentioned, but reading um, many, many of those students of, of esotericism are reading so much and have a huge knowledge also through that reading. But the practice is set aside and you find that even in organizations, um, uh, esoteric organizations that um, uh, you have students there who know everything, every detail, why in this ritual this comma is said there and not here. But 
they don't know how to pronounce the, the ritual. You know, you know what I mean? I, I mean, the practical side um, is set aside uh, and just intellectualized. Well, and, and here we run into something else, too, that, that people have different qualities. And the role of group work is to help us to develop the many aspects of ourself through, through really the problems we encounter with others. In overcoming those problems, particularly in an esoteric group, we really make progress. And I always say, look, if, if you're in an occult group or esoteric group and you can't get along with each other, uh, you know, please don't talk to me about how you're going to make the world a better place. Mm. I mean, just, just stop already. <laughs> stop with the lies. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so when we're in a, an esoteric group and uh, we learn and grow, I mean, I grew a lot through my experiences because it forced me to do public speaking. It forced me to learn how to do take minutes of a meeting. I mean, you think, well, what does this have to do with uh, esotericism? One is everything. Mm. It is everything. Mm. It's about how these things are practical in your life. How you overcome that spiritual material divide and realize that everything everything is part of the past yeah so yeah. when we when we look at some people i can think of one grand master in particular who was a spectacular ritualist and a terrible administrator mm -hmm. i've seen this in masonic lodges and i'm sure you have as well of course and now they're even talking here in Pennsylvania as having a, a dual condition because the grandma said, look, we know some people are just really good at ritual, but they can't run a lodge. So we're going to have, we're going to set up a situation where this person does the ritual work and this person does the administrative work. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Well, the secretary could take that role already well, in a normal setup. But I yeah, hear the yeah. secretaries are for life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, okay. You know, they yeah. get in, they never change. Maybe we don't, want to, yeah, give, we don't yeah, want to give yeah. them any more power than they already have. <laughs> but it's recognizing what do you mean? The, the need to have, be flexible with people. Now, the same is true in, you know, when, when we're in these other activities is that, we have to have faith in what we're doing and not look for the magic pill and not look yeah. for that practice, that one thing, which is going to solve all my problems for me. And now uh, people have so much material available to them. It's like a kind of bulimia. They, 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 bur they, they binge and purge. So they mm -hmm. don't really know what to do and they don't really get anything done. You, you yeah. have to pick something and you have to stay with it. Stay with it for a set period of time, even if it's just for three months or six months, and then go on. But at least know you've completed. And, and there you have to have the faith that the thing that you picked is the right one for you and not. Well, of course, there are 20 others you could have taken as well. But once you chose one, well, carry on with it. I think that's a crucial thing. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing with devotion. If you want to do wor worship of deities, deity work, fine. Uh Do one for three months. Do do Toth for three months and understand why. Then do Isis for three months or Ta or Ra, whatever, pick or whatever it is. And then, okay, you've done it. Instead of having an altar that's littered and cluttered with all sorts of things. And then when you get sit down to do work, you, you're, you're distracted by all of it. You know, your altar area, your work area should be very clean, very focused. Uh, you know, behind me, what you can see is exclusively Egyptian. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Over here is exclusively uh, German folk magic and, and Renaissance magic. The two okay. aren't there. They're not connected. Okay. Do you, do you understand yeah. what I'm sure. saying? I don't, sure. I don't clutter sure. everything in one place. Yeah, sure. No, no, I see what you mean. And if I didn't have the space, I would simply keep everything in a box or a filing cabinet Separate. or a drawer and take mm. it out as I need it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have a bit of similar setup. You see in background here the 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 sound magic back yeah. there on the wall, and and here on this side there's something completely different, more hermetic. So of course, yes, absolutely. And it yeah, allows yeah, us yeah. to to stay focused. Okay. 
Exactly. But um, of course, the 21st century, our times, so to speak, to use a generic term, which is a bit, um, well, too generic. But anyway, um, of course, it goes all against that because we all have to be so quick and to change and to modify all the time, all the time. So you could say esotericism is the opposite of that. Now, does that mean that esotericism is just something you have to choose and then stick with it? Or does esotericism also have to adapt in some way because it's made out of men, right? Men and women. I mean, of course, uh, uh, human beings, I guess, right? Uh, um, is it, is it, so the human beings change? Does esotericism change with them? Yes and no. Hmm. Uh, the fundamental truths never change. And that's hmm. where we run into problems now in occult publishing where you see a lot of uh, political correct correctness seeking to censor books and have trigger warnings on yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you, if, a, if occultism offends you, then uh, either you've done something right and you're offended and that's good, or you're doing something wrong because you're offended by it and you don't know that this is supposed to challenge you. Yeah. That maybe, yeah. maybe you're wrong. Maybe that uh, just because you have a bunch of people who have this belief uh, that you can be whatever you call yourself when you call yourself. No, that's not necessarily true, that there are physical limits. Right, right. I can right. look it. And I'll say it. So I'll say it again. A guy could call himself a girl. It doesn't make him a woman. And having him and having him participate in female sports is wrong. Mm. Yeah. Now, he can do whatever he wants in his private life. Yeah. He can even do it every once in his professional life. But there's biological, physical differences between men and women that on the athletic field are demonstrable. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And that's it. And the fact that people are afraid to say that makes them incapable of following the esoteric path because they're afraid of the truth. And that's a, a deep that's one of the main problems with the hermet problems with their in the understanding of the hermetic laws the difference between the polarity and the sexuality law right that, that you have those two laws which do not mean the same thing at all but it's off they are often completely mixed up in general thinking right yeah. well and and with that is this notion then of um because i can change something quickly mentally I can switch ideas mentally and I can maybe even switch emotions and feelings quickly that that's a change of reality. And it's not the physical yeah. world didn't follow. Doesn't change. Yeah. And yeah. you know, the physical world doesn't necessarily have to agree with me. Yeah. You know, I have to agree with it, which comes down to the, the certain realities of uh, Saturn always wins. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know what to do, If you're confused, that's okay. What you do then is you set up your altar any way you want, maybe just with a single candle, maybe just with a, something to write on for when you get inspired. And every day at the same time, for the same amount of time, so you decide whether it's five minutes, 10, 15 minutes, it doesn't have to be heroic, it doesn't have to be an hour. It just has to be a time that you're comfortable with and that you can do because you're going to do it every day. You're not going to miss is you say a prayer to the gods of wisdom in whatever form they may be. If you're not certain about that, you could say a prayer to Saturn. Saturn is always good to open up and make clear your path. Saturn, open up and make clear my path that I may know what direction to go that I may best understand myself and undertake this path of return, this path of self-awakening yeah. or do it to the gods. It was, and in fact, you should make that prayer before you do any work. And in this kind of, I'll just share with you now, kind of my reasoning behind that is, you know, that some people before they do any ritual work, they feel they need to do a divination to know whether they should do it or not. And, oh, really? and, mm -hmm. and my view is if you need to do a divination to know whether you should do it or not, don't do it. You should know. Yeah. 
Never come across that, but uh, interesting. Yeah, it, it's fairly big in Golden Dawn circles. Huh? Yeah, it's, I say, hey, either either do it or don't. Just own it. Exactly. And that's where we're moving into this other part is you have to take full responsibility for everything on the mm -hmm. path. You no longer think of injustice or unfairness. Yeah. There's karma. There's cause and effect. There's cause and result. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what you're constantly referring to now. And your reflection now is on your own life. You're less concerned about what others do or say because you can't control that. But what you can control is your whether you respond to what they do or whether you react to what they do. Exactly. And yeah. a reaction yeah. is a habit, a pattern, a response is thought out. It is decided upon. So big difference. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is yeah. you know, now what people say, what does this have to do with esotericism? Well, everything, because when you're in a ritual or when you're in an out of body experience or when you're having a, a lucid dream, your capacity to stay focused decides whether you're going to benefit strongly from that situation or, or possibly be injured or even destroyed by it. Yeah. But it's your responsibility. That's like, that's the main issue. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like I said, <laughs> if, you're, if you're afraid, if you need trigger warnings on your occult books, if you're that afraid yeah. of words, don't ever step inside a ritual circle. E exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Um, you, you mentioned before that when you do group work, of course, then yes, um, the different strengths and weaknesses can be covered by different people. So administration, ritual leading, uh, intellectual work as opposed to practical yes. work, etc. Um, uh, any any advice? And I remember your book, Egregore, of course, which I highly recommend to read for everyone. But um, what would you suggest to the newcomer uh, solo work in the beginning and look for a group later? Or is group work in the beginning something good? Or is there not such a difference? Is it rather on the individual that, it, that the decision comes? What, what's your feeling on that? I think that the individual in the beginning, in the beginning, I'll say maybe two, three years, Right. Okay, so you're you're 15, 16 years old and you want to get started in this. You do what I just said about the other work. You get those books. Even if you're 25 or 30, you get that stuff. But we know a lot of folks start in their teen years. So yeah. you get those. You pay close attention to them. You pay close attention to yourself because this is a powerful time for you metabolically and uh, and, and mentally. Your brain is growing at a tremendous rate. Your, your body's changing. Uh, even as you're, you say on your, you're the flip side of 30, the same is happening to some degree. Pay attention to how you're responding to these practices and relax. Relax, relax, relax. Just mm. do something every day and move on with your life. That's something every day and move on. Now, in that same time frame, you want to have the focal point that you are open to and would like to meet with a group of people or maybe an individual, a teacher, but a group of, uh, that can help you on your journey and who in turn you can help as well. Because remember, it's a two-way street. It's not just one sure. way. They're going to help me because I'm special. Well, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. Anyone who's going to help you because you're special is going to take a, probably a good helping to a lot of stuff about you that you weren't ready for, whether it's your pocketbook or your time or worse. Yeah, yeah. or maybe your purse was also, was also interesting to them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so just take your time and be on the lookout for groups. Be cautious. Be slow to join them. Take your time. There's no rush. There's no rush. Pay attention to the people in the group. Do you like them? Do you want to be like them? Okay. What, how are their daily lives going? Same thing with the teacher. Yeah. How is their day-to-day -day life? Okay. So are the, if the promises are too good to be true, they probably are. Exactly. If they're too quick to bring you in, that's a problem too. And if they forbid you to go out, very big caveat. Getting out should be as easy as getting in. 
Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I had that was one thing mentioning Armorc. Um, of course, you can get out of Armorc at any time. But what I really found um, strange is that they want you to send back those leaflets they send you every month. Uh, um, and nobody does. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But I mean, even the 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 the, the, the uh, that they want that. I mean, they don't own the words today right well that was uh that was interesting because the golden dawn had the same setup there were these little uh oh, really? coupons mm -hmm. yeah that would be pasted on the notes and of course back in the golden dawn days you would pay whatever it is six pence or whatever or two shillings the document would be loaned to you you would write out your copy by hand and then right. in your folder on the folder would be this sticker that says upon my death return this to and it would have the lodge yeah know? of course uh, yes 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 so yes. that was a fairly common practice uh now they send their stuff out by as pdfs so that nothing, no. <laughs> nothing gets yeah. returned yeah, exactly it's different it's different <laughs> no, no but that was back in the 1990 back in the days yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah yeah exactly exactly um, we promised to talk about um, alchemy, about divination, and I don't remember the third thing that we mentioned in the beginning. Um, um, but uh, alchemy and divination already as special as special um, um, sub sub uh, uh, interest. Let's call it that way. Um, What's your advice on, on those things? If you want to go deeper into one of those special techniques or knowledges? I think it's really good to have one or two areas that you want to specialize in, but mm -hmm. they should not be to the detriment of your basic practice of self-understanding. Same mm -hmm. thing with ritual work. You know, ritual work should have a purpose and a goal, not just something right. that you do out of habit. Just nice. Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. So you need to make sure that you have a nice, solid, strong daily practice, that you're benefiting from it, that you can over time, over the several months or maybe a year or two years, you can begin to sense the differences in yourself. You can really notice them, whether it's psychic phenomena or out of body experiences or lucid dreams or something to this effect. Or just the fact that you're you're handling your problems better, not that your problems go away because they don't. Yeah, sure. And I think that's important to note. The further you go on the path, the harder it gets, the more problems you have, not less. Because you're you're yeah. getting rid of those obstructions within yourself. You know, so those which aren't dissolved for so to speak, they have to be resolved. It's either dissolved or resolved. You know, and Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So as yeah. you as you're going through you're you're learning how to be more calm, more focused, more self confident, more polite. Uh, I see a lot of folks uh, in occultism, particularly in the younger group between, say, we'll say 20 to 35, even 40, who are terribly rude. They have no manners. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, a terrible sign. Yes, we all have moments. We can lose our temper. We can get upset. But we, we acknowledge it. We apologize for it. We, we try not to do it again. We do our best not to do it again. So how people are treated and how you're treating people is an important sign on the path, how you deal with others. So all of this comes together. So you should be, fo so if you're a great astrologer, but you're just terrible to be around, I mean, who's going to benefit from that? Same thing if you're a great geomancer, but you just, no one wants to be around you. Uh, yeah. You know, so you have to develop your, your personality and your character which is your self-understanding along with your ritual capacity, along with your divination capacity. And, and alchemy is certainly going to take care of that for you. you you're not going to be, uh, alchemy will, will, will literally burn it out of you. Do you think there are certain of those, well, what do you call them, techniques or, or, or sub, sub, uh, subjects or whatever you want to call it? Um, are there certain of those who, which will be generally more beneficial to the practitioner than others? Or is this a real individual personal decision depending on your capacity, your interest, your talent? Yeah, that's a tough one. I think on one hand, there's a certain amount of general uh, capacity. We have to be careful not to go towards the things which are most 
attractive to us, but maybe not so beneficial. Uh, we see a lot of people obsessed with doing Goetia and demonic evocation and that kind of thing. Uh, mm-hmm. I know people who are horrified of it. And I said, listen, uh, you shouldn't be afraid of it. You shouldn't be horrified of it. Uh, but you shouldn't rush to it either. It shouldn't be your only journey. Everything has a place. And this is where the gods of wisdom come in. Helping you to understand. That's why I said, make your prayers to Saturn, make your prayers to wisdom, to find which best for you, which best for you on your journey. Yes, yes, certainly. And um, I'd like to devote a little bit of time on divination a bit more because that's such a, a subject which leaves many puzzled. At the same time, it's very yeah. attractive because you have the impression you do things that nobody else can do. Um, what is well i don't know if the question should be put like that but i put it like that what is the right path to divination how do you find out your path in that i think if you do something like um would you say geomancy for example i had a great uncle who was very good at it and he didn't do it a lot but i have some of his notes like when when my brother's car was stolen you know he did this, i have okay. this geomantic reading on it oh it'll be found and it was found two days later you know? <laughs> um, great. somebody took it for a joy ride uh fortunately nothing was was harmed uh, and those yeah. types of things those can be very beneficial uh so what you do is you find balance in it you don't overdo it uh mm-hmm. there are some people who enter into divination so like tarot for example And they do a reading every day. Like they get up and they do a reading. Day. Well, no, you have to take responsibility for your life. Uh, don't don't let it control you. Mm-hmm. Let it aid you. Let it assist you. Let it help you. But you have to have confidence in yourself. Because how many people don't you know that would do? They do one form of a card reading or another, and they didn't like the answer, so they did another one. Yeah, yeah that's the exactly. joke, right? It's like going to a doctor because he, he tells you to stop smoking. What you do, you change the doctor. That's right, you exactly. change doctors. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> so that, that's where you know we can study these things like uh, crystal balls. Um, uh, I was never very good with a crystal ball. I was better with a mirror. Okay, uh, mm-hmm. visionary work with mirrors. Uh, yeah, but. You can do all of this, but you have to have it has to be, help your path, it has to help your journey, not become a distraction or uh, or worse yet, uh, mm-hmm. a crutch, a crutch of something. Right, right, right. What about those very well, uh, goût du jour, you would say in French, um, things like Solomonic magic yeah. or stuff like that. They are very much around and people find them very fancy and, and, and cool. Um, personally, but that's personal. Uh, I've never been attracted to that because I kind of find them a bit um, far away from the, from the roots, so to speak. But maybe I'm completely wrong about that. Um, what's your point on that? Well, Again, these are demanding practices. And Mm. what I have found is going back to the fundamentals. Yeah. You know, be silent. Mm. Uh, When I see folks posting pictures on the Internet and Facebook of their uh, ceremonial work or their spagyric or alchemical work. And of course, I'm not referring to people who I, I, I know well and who will post videos of a process they've done and they're sharing it now with you so you can understand this whole alchemical process. Okay, they're taking you through it. They're guiding you. Now, there's just people want to show off their new tool, their new book, their new whatever. Um, That's incredibly destructive to your path. That's incredibly destructive to your journey because you can't be trusted to keep a secret. You've got to tell everyone. You're not only you're telling strangers, people you don't know. You're inviting into your inner psychic life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, why? First of all, yeah. I don't want to know it. I don't. I don't need to be burdened with that. <laughs> and, and second of all, why are you? Why do you need to tell other people about how what you think you're capable of? If you're truly capable of it, you'd be doing more and you'd be talking less and showing right. less. Right. And I'm very adamant about that. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, one could say here to know, to dare, to will, to keep silent, right? right? A very, very, maybe that's even a kind of a good def definition of a pass altogether. Yes. Uh, um, to know, to dare, to will, to keep silent. And, and that sums it up rather well, doesn't it? Yeah. If, if yeah. you can't keep silent, which is the, the, the virtue of Saturn, the virtue of the Earth, it's not going to open up any of its powers to you. Exactly. exactly. Because you're, you exactly. can't be trusted with them. And go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that everyone knows this. They've all experienced it. And I remember one example of it in my own life. I'm trying to remember how old I was uh, because that may not even matter. But everyone will recognize the time they did it. You were very enthusiastic about something, a project or something you're going to do and undertake. And you told someone, and just at that moment, it was like all the air went out of a balloon. Yeah. Now, I want you to remember that yeah. because that's what you're doing every time you just chatter off about this vision, that dream. You don't have enough discrimination. You know, I'm going to write down the dream I had and ask for people's interpretation of it. That's the definition of narcissism and also the definition of foolishness. Yeah. So you have to learn to be self-confident, patient, um, responsible, and reflective. And that requires a very mature and adult attitude. And, yeah. and, and that means silence, learning how to be silent and, okay, and just waiting in patience. With silence yeah. is patience. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, exactly. Dubuis said above every, the door to every alchemist's laboratory should be the word patience. And I, I actually have that because that's the key patience because patience doesn't mean you sit and wait. Patience means you consistently and regularly just keep moving forward towards the goal. And you focus, you focus. Yes, yes, absolutely. There is one group which I would commit a few minutes here at the end of this interview too in particular because I've met more and more people like that lately maybe that's just a particular thing of me but um, you mentioned that, that many people start at the age of 15 to 18 to delve into that uh, the, that work that's certainly a majority then others maybe 10 years later um, but I have also met more and more people lately who are in their 40s or early 50s who suddenly because the world changes and they speak to me and to find out I do that podcast I came from a world which where that was not at all known 10 years ago right because I never talked about it doing those things but suddenly they found out they were, hey this interests me um how how can I find out more about that world but is there a difference except for the basic rule of course so for your motivation and your devotion but um is there a, a different Pass to take when you are 40 ish, 50 ish, and find out about the esotericism? You know, that's a tough call. And I'm going to say on a more serious note, yes. Mm. And you have more life experience behind you. You, mm -hmm. in theory, have more skills. And you, in theory, have less time. Yeah. So I think that you're practices should focus on that reality. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm 40, I'm 50. Uh, I'm starting this. What is going to benefit me most uh, in my future or in my, you know, my future situation. And that may mean your sense of the afterlife or it may mean reincarnation which is something we've talked about on the previous uh, podcast. Yeah. And I yeah. think that that really should be the focal point. Uh, you, right. you don't have as much time to uh, engage in experimentation. So I would say to be honest with yourself about that reality and, and focus on the development of your, your consciousness, your, your self-awareness, stability of that, and then how that relates to, again, as we've talked about, uh, death and afterlife survival. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it was important to mention that because I don't know why, but it, it 
comes up to me more and more lately. Yeah, yeah. Maybe people are looking for more sense in life lately yeah. because all the things that happened the last two years maybe made them had they had more time also to think about it. Maybe I think yeah. so. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Well, Mark, thank you so much for your time. Um, this was great. Um, you know that often uh, when the situation uh, uh, is, is, is ready for that, and I think in that case it is, maybe you give us a kind of final thought, a final word for our audience that they can carry on meditating on if they wish. Oh, just get started. You know, look at the books we've talked about. Uh, just start one thing a day. Stay focused on it for a month, maybe two or three at most, then move on to the next and just have confidence in your ability to find your way. And you will. And you will. And just do that. Be patient with yourself and be patient with others and do something every day. And you will find after three, six, 12 months, things open up. You change as a person and uh, in ways that you wouldn't if you went to the book of the month club. You know? So dis discipline is freedom. Discipline is your friend. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Mark. And uh, well, I hope it was not the last time that we met here on Thos Hermes and uh, uh, um, looking forward to next time. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much.
Transmission 94 by Into Space. And so this was the end of this episode. Uh, well, I need to thank Mark really, really for this interesting talk and his expertise. And I think we exchanged on a lot of topics in the end. It was much more than something for beginners. I think it's something there for everyone. And uh, I really enjoyed to talk with him. I'm sure it was not the last time we do that. So, um, yeah, well, thank you also. Thank you, everyone, for being with us here today and listening in. It was great to have you, and I hope you will be coming back next week again for another show on the Thoughts Hermes podcast. Episode 14, it will be on May, that will be May 13th. 29 yes may 29th and my guests well very special guest next week um maybe a bit less esoteric than usual but somebody who has a lot to say about shamanism about nature about um, the approach how we live in this world with nature and sometimes on often against nature and he is wolf dieter storl wolf dieter storl a very well-known bioethnologist i would call him he's written a lot of books on plants and their healing capacities but also the plant spirits etc etc so we're going to talk about all this he's german as you can say by his name but um, he's lived for a long time in america his english is very american and very perfect and um, he's now 80 years old and we will get a lot from his experience and the occasion for this is that he recently published his biography which was previously published in German it was now published also in English and it's called Far Out in America because it talks about his time in America and uh, well Far Out in America of course this was the occasion to make that interview great so um, this was today's episode episode 13 of season eight. Thank you so much for being with us and take care. Stay tuned. Hear you soon.